Okay, we're live, and today I want to talk about the atonement of Christ and who Jesus died for. I know we read through the uh, Synod of Dort recently, um, but I also wanted to go through um, just all the many, many passages uh, that I think clearly teach that uh, when it comes to the Bible's teaching on for whom Jesus Christ died and what his purpose was in coming into this world, um, what he came into the world to do was to save his people from their sins. And he has a specific people. He did not come to uh, make salvation possible. Uh, Jesus did not come into the world to open the door for all. Uh, he did not come to take a shot at saving as many as possible with their free will. He came into the world with a group of human beings that have been elected by name as individuals by God the Father from before the foundation of the world and trusted to his care to save them from their sins. And that's the heart and soul of the mission of Christ. And when he finished his work on the cross, it was indeed uh, a finished work. It was a full payment for their sins. And now he is gathering um, his children uh, as a Caiaphas uh, prophesied correctly, even though he was an evil man, um, in John, in the Gospel of John, uh, when he said that he would die not just for the nation, but for all the children of God who were scattered abroad. And I want to just look at uh, a whole slew of passages and also look at an explanation of this uh, from this great little paperback book that I bought years ago, Five Points of Calvinism, defined, defended, and documented by uh, David Steele and Curtis Thomas. And I just want to get into this and just make some comments along the way. I think this is extremely important subject. Um, this is not a, a reformed hobby horse. This is a vitally important question to know for whom did Christ die? In order to secure their redemption, Jesus Christ came into the world and took upon himself human nature so that he might identify himself with his people and act as their legal representative or substitute. Christ, acting on behalf of his people, perfectly kept God's law, and thereby worked out a perfect righteousness which is imputed or credited to them the moment they are brought to faith in him. Through what he did, they are constituted righteous before God. They're also freed from all guilt and condemnation as the result of what Christ suffered for them. Through his substitutionary sacrifice, he endured the penalty of their sins and thus removed their guilt forever. Consequently, when his people are joined to him by faith, they are credited with perfect righteousness and are freed from all guilt and condemnation. They are saved not because of what they themselves have done or will do, but solely on the ground of Christ's redeeming work. Okay, excellent point there. Uh, Christ is a redeeming work. It is a saving work. It's not a provision. He's not making a provision. He came to save his people. Just continuing on here, historical or mainline Calvinism has consistently maintained that Christ's redeeming work was definite in design and accomplishment, that it was intended to render complete satisfaction for certain specified sinners, and that it actually secured salvation for these individuals and for no one else. The salvation which Christ earned for his people includes everything involved in bringing them into a right relationship with God including the gifts of faith and repentance. Christ did not die simply to make it possible. Christ died to do, uh, to make it possible. Pardon sinners. If on other grounds they meet his demands, such as their faith, their works, their perseverance, and so forth, their repentance. Neither does God leave it up to sinners as to whether or not Christ's work will be effective. On the contrary, all for whom Christ sacrificed himself will be saved infallibly, Redemption, therefore, was designed to bring to pass God's purpose of election. But he came into the world to represent and save only those given to him by the Father. Thus, Christ's saving work was limited in that it was designed to save some and not others. But it was not limited in value, for it was of infinite worth and would have secured salvation for everyone if this had been God's intention. Okay, so this is one of the key questions I think many people do not think to ask. And you have to ask this question. What was the intention of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the incarnation, life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and intercession of Jesus Christ? What was God's intention in that? What was he, what was he doing in that? And what, what did he do? What was accomplished by that? That's a key question. The Arminians also place a limitation on the atoning work of Christ, but one of a much different nature. They hold that Christ's saving work was designed to make possible the salvation of all 
on the condition that they believe, but that Christ's death in itself did not actually secure or guarantee salvation for anyone. Since all men will not be saved as a result, as the result of work, a limitation must be admitted. Either the atonement was limited in that it was designed to secure salvation for certain sinners, but not for others, or it was limited in that it was not intended to secure salvation for any, but was designed only to make it possible for sinners on the condition that they believe. In other words, one must limit its design either in extent, it was not intended for all, or effectiveness, it did not secure salvation for any. As Lorraine Bettner so aptly observes, for the Calvinists, the atonement is like a narrow bridge which goes all the way across the stream. For the Arminians, it is like a great wide bridge that goes only halfway across. <laughs> now, there's a great Spurgeon quote here at the bottom of the page. Spurgeon's comments as to whether it is the Calvinists or the Arminians who limit the atonement um, are to the point. Listen to Spurgeon here. Who's really limiting the atonement here? Who's really... Which side, the Arminians or the Calvinists, is really limiting God here? We are often told that we limit the atonement of Christ because we say that Christ has not made a satisfaction for all men, or all men would be saved. Now, our reply to this is that, on the other hand, our opponents limit it. We do not. The Arminians say Christ died for all men. What they mean by it, did Christ die to secure the salvation of all men? They say, no, certainly not. We ask them the next question, did Christ die so as to secure the salvation of any man in particular? They answer, no. They are obliged to admit this if they are consistent. They say, no, Christ has died that any man may be saved if men follow certain conditions of salvation. Now, who is it that limits the death of Christ? Why you? You say that Christ did not die so as to infallibly secure the salvation of anybody. We beg your pardon when you say we limit Christ's death. We say, no, my dear sir, it is you that do it. We say Christ so died that he infallibly secured the salvation of a multitude that no man can number, who through Christ's death not only may be saved, but are saved, and cannot by any possibility run the hazard of being anything but saved. You are welcome to your atonement. You may keep it. We will never renounce ours for the sake of it, end quote. And I can only give three hearty amens to that. Okay, so let's look at the scriptures here. The, the bottom line is, what does the Bible say? What does the Holy Spirit say in divine scripture? The scriptures describe the end intended and accomplished by Christ's work as the full salvation. Okay, not, not a provision of salvation, but actual salvation. This is, these are the texts of scripture right, that we're going to look at that really did me in and pushed me over the edge. Because I was still thinking... No, because even the elect come into the world under the wrath of God. It's not like the, the cross actually saves them. And then realizing and seeing that faith and repentance are blood purchase gifts of Christ for his elect people. It is God who draws them to Christ in his time um, by his decree and his sovereign providence uh, and raising up ministers and parents and, and, and uh, the Internet and radio waves. And however he's going to draw his elect to himself, the death of Christ is seen as something which saves not makes it possible, but actually, actually saves. Listen, Matthew 1, 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And what is that saying? He'll, he'll make the salvation of everyone in the race of Adam possible. That is just not what it says. And there's no possible way you could get that from this. He will save who? His people. Who are his people? The ones chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. The ones given to him by his father. Those are his people. He will save his people from their sins. That's why he's named Jesus. What does Jesus mean? It means Yahweh is salvation. Luke 19.10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save, which was lost. Again, it's not, it's not hypothetical. It's not possible. He came to seek and to save. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sakes, God made him, Christ, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. Everyone for whom Christ was made sin will be made the righteousness of God in him. They will go to heaven. They will have his righteousness imputed to their account. They will be justified before him. They will go to heaven. Galatians 1, 3, and 4. This was one, I remember the first time I ever read this in this context, and I just had never noticed this. Listen to the way that Christ's death is spoken. Here. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins 
to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. Everyone for whom Christ gave himself is delivered from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. He came to save. To save. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity and to purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. So the giving of himself at the cross was to do what? To make redemption possible? To make sanctification possible? No. He gave himself to redeem us from our iniquities and to sanctify us, to make us zealous for good works. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ has also died for sins once for all, the righteous in the place of the unrighteous, us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. What's the result? That we're brought to God. Not that it's possible that we could be brought to God, but that we are brought by Christ to God. That's the result of the death of Christ. The scriptures declare that as the result of what Christ did and suffered, his people are reconciled to God, justified, and given the Holy Spirit who regenerates and sanctifies them. All these blessings were secured by Christ himself for his people. Now listen to these passages. 2 Corinthians 5.18, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Those for whom he died are reconciled to him. When it says world, it's talking about the, the Jewish and Gentile world, people from every tribe, nation, tongue, and people and language. And we'll get that later because everyone's going to going to want to know about what about 1 John 2, 2? What about 2 Peter 3, 9? What about 1 Timothy 2, 2, 4? What about Matthew 23, 37? We're going to look at the big three. We'll look at those here in a little bit. I think that's that's in this section. And in fact, if, if we can't, I actually did a whole sermon uh, just on those those passages that Norm Geisler quotes constantly. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, 1 Timothy 2, 4, Matthew 23, 37. Colossians 1, 21. And you who once were estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him. Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me. The faith in Christ is guaranteed by the decree of election. Okay, Therefore, it's okay for the Holy Spirit to speak all over the place. The death of Christ reconciles the people of God to God. The death of Christ delivers us from the age to come. The death of Christ redeems all for whom that death is, is given from all their lawless deeds. Christ secured the righteousness and pardon needed by his people for their justification. Okay, Romans 3, 24. They are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as, a, as an expiation. <laughs> this is These are these quotations are from the RSV. I'm just not used to reading the RSV in his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. But it says received by faith, right, but we're saved through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Faith simply being the divinely given saving grace by which we are linked to our Redeemer in time and space at God's appointed moment. Okay, justification is by faith. We do have to believe in Christ, but saving faith is the gift of God. God for his elect people. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Romans 5, 8, and 9. But God shows his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we are now justified by his blood. Where's faith here? Well, the, the assumption is that if Christ died for you, at some point you will have faith. And so that there's a sense in which you've been justified by his blood. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse in our behalf in behalf of us so if he did that for you then you cannot possibly be anything but redeemed hebrews 9 12 he entered once for all into the holy place taking not the blood of goats and calves but his own blood thus securing an eternal redemption first peter 2 24 he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed and it's not that well if you believe, then he died for your sins. No, it, the, the cross work of Christ is designed 
only for his elect. And in time and space, at God's appointed moment, they will be effectually called and brought to their Savior, that they will hear the gospel of their salvation. Ephesians 1, here's, I got to point out, that guy, Aeon Tactics, I don't know what his real name is, but that's his screen name, said, you know, I was disingenuous in my response to him. I read everything the guy wrote about Ephesians 1, and, and it was easy to refute, easy to refute. He just kept saying, well, it's written to the faithful in Christ. So when it says he chose us, he's talking about the faithful in Christ. And I just pointed out to him, when does God's choice take place according to the text before the foundation of the world? Question, are they the faithful in Christ before God even creates anything? I mean, what could be more obvious? Of course, they're not the faithful in Christ. They don't exist yet. They're only in God's heart and mind. And surely you're not saying, well, he predestined them and chose them because, be, because they're already the faithful in Christ. It doesn't make any sense. It's putting the cart before the horse. The reason they become the faithful in Christ is because God chose them to that end. He predestined them to adoption, it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, before they were the faithful in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, that we would become the faithful in Christ. Philippians 1.29, it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Where does believing in Christ come from? Christ. Not us, not our autonomy, not our free will, not because he opened the door and made it possible, but to believe, not the possibility of belief, but to believe, to believe is granted to us by Christ. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity and to purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good works. So the giving of himself does what? Makes redemption possible. It's not what it says. Gave himself for us to redeem us. Everyone he did that for will be redeemed. 1 Corinthians 1.30, he is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness, justification, and redemption. Hebrews 9.14, how much more then shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to the living God? The blood of Christ does what? purifies people's consciences from dead works to serve the living God. Every person that blood was shed for, that's what's done. They're saved, justified, and their consciences are purified from dead works to serve the living God. It accomplishes that. It accomplishes and secures everything necessary for that to happen. First John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And then we get into... Um, the clear passages we've looked at these many times before john 6 uh john chapter 10 um john 17 and then ephesians 1 and there's there's other passages here that are, are crystal 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 clear this is john 6 38 and 39 and this is the will of him who sent me he has given me i will lose none but raise it up at the last day why did he come into the world to try to save everyone no not of all he has given me i will lose none okay so let's let's think for a minute <clears throat> Passages, some passages speak of Christ dying for all men and of his death as saving the world. Yet others speak of his death as being definite in design and of his dying for particular people and securing salvation for them. Okay, so let's think about this. There are two classes of texts that speak of Christ's saving work in general terms. Those containing the word world. Okay, John uh, 1, 9 and John 1, 29. Um, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 3, 16, God so loved the world. John 4, 42, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, reconciling the world to himself. First John 2, 1 and 2, he's propitiation for our sins, not just for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. First John 4, 14, same thing. Those containing the word all, Romans 5, 18, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Timothy 2, 4, um, the God who desires uh, all men um, to be saved, etc. Hebrews 2, 9, and 2 Peter 3, 9. One reason for the use of these expressions was to correct the false notion that salvation was for the Jews alone. I can't emphasize that enough. Think about how, how much of an obstacle that was 
to overcome in the book of Acts. You know, Peter had to had to have an illustration and they had to have a council. The sheet that came down and God pronounced the unclean animals to be clean. And that one of the applications of that is that Gentiles are not to be are not to be considered or seen as unclean. And they don't need to become Jews either. They just need to believe, to repent and believe, and they're brought into the church, just like Jews are. And Peter argued with Jesus about it in Acts chapter 11. But when you look at the key passages that are actually addressing explicitly, explicitly, it, it's always limited to his people, his elect people, his sheep. Who does he lay his life down for? The sheep. He tells his opponents, you don't believe because you're not of my sheep. And so Jesus didn't lay his life down for them, and that's why they don't believe. Okay, so very clearly when scripture addresses those things straightforwardly, it's always limited to his people, to his sheep. When it's speaking more broadly, speaking in terms of the Great Commission, speaking in terms of the mission of the church, it goes out to the whole world. And he's he the propitiation, not just for our sins, but for those of the whole world and so on and so forth. And I think that's about it. Yeah, that's about it here. Okay, um, I've still got a bunch of stuff I got to get done today. And that's uh, we're about at the half hour mark. Uh, so a very small group today, only four or five people were here, but hopefully uh, some more folks will listen later. But hopefully that's been helpful to you to look at scripture and who Jesus died for. And uh, so thankful that um, his death for me secured my faith and my repentance and my perseverance in both until the day I die. And therefore all praise, honor and glory goes to Christ alone, not for making my salvation possible, but for accomplishing it perfectly. Thanks for watching or listening.